Live from Fargo and serving you on TV, online, and on the go. This is Valley News Live at 5. We're following storms that could turn severe this afternoon and this evening. This is a live look from Valley News Live storm chaser Eric Whitehill. He's near Sisseton, South Dakota. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our storm team has been keeping an eye on the sky and the radar all day. Tornadoes have already been spotted in some areas of southern Minnesota. Let's go to Chief Meteorologist Hutch Johnson for the very latest. Hutch? Thanks so much, Andrea. As we head through the evening, radar shows a spiraling low pressure system that is centered in southeast North Dakota and northeast South Dakota right now. The most abundant lightning toward the Twin Cities is where the strongest thunderstorms are, but there's a lot of spin in our environment tonight. As we take a look at the Southern Valley, uh, out west near Jamestown, good old fashioned rain showers likely, but there's a little cluster of storms near Sisseton that has produced uh, a few tornadoes confirmed on the ground as we've headed through the late afternoon hours. And they continue to rotate. And not long ago, there was a tornado warning for this line of cells right here near Sisseton, moving into Beardsley and pushing up into portions of southern Traverse County right now. Our storm chaser, Eric Whitehill, is positioned near Sisseton, monitoring these storms. And they have produced wall clouds. And some funnel clouds as well as we head through the evening. Now, the environment is such that even into the early evening hours, we will have that risk of severe weather in our southern counties. A few funnel clouds are possible. An isolated tornado is possible, Fargo and Point South, specifically Traverse County and Grant County, Minnesota, toward Western Otter Tail County as we go through the evening. There is a tornado watch for much of southern Minnesota where there's more potent energy in the atmosphere. Again, Roberts County out to the east is where the best risk will be as we go through the evening tonight. We'll keep you updated during the show. If anything gets real bad, we'll get right on and let you know about it. But it does look like these strong storms as they push north of Fargo tonight, uh, the chance of severe greatly diminishes. All right. Thank you so much, Hutch. Mm -hmm. And you can stay up to date on the weather conditions where you are anytime on your smartphone or tablet. Just download the Storm Team Weather app to get the latest weather conditions and even follow the radar live. Just search VNL Weather in the App Store. We're getting a dramatic and emotional picture of what happened inside an Orlando nightclub during the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. For the first time, some of the victims held hostage are speaking out. Jay Gray has their story and the latest on the investigation. Oh my God, people are getting shot. Today, for the first time since the attack, we're getting a closer look inside the chaos from a hostage. Bullets start going through the stall wall towards us. I was in, on the ground in a pool of blood. I wasn't sure whose it was. Angel Santiago and Patience Carter were shot, then held at gunpoint by the alleged shooter, Omar Mateen. We got trapped in there. The gunman entered the bathroom and was shooting his machine gun. So we're all like scrambling around in the bathroom, screaming at the top of our lungs. But Carter says Mateen was calm and deliberate during the attack. He pledged his allegiance to ISIS and he started speaking. And I believe after he got off the, the, the phone with 911, he started speaking in Arabic. He even spoke to us directly in the bathroom. Telling survivors to stay off their phones as the massacre continued. I never thought in a million years that my eyes could witness something so tragic. A horrific plan that investigators say Mateen's current wife, Noor Zahai Salman, tried to stop him from carrying out. NBC News has also learned she was with him when he bought ammunition in a holster and drove him to the Pulse nightclub weeks before the killing spree. Police and federal agents are still investigating her role, and the FBI is taking a serious and much closer look now at reports from those in Orlando's gay community that Mateen had been seen in gay nightclubs, including Pulse, for years, and that he often communicated with gay men online. I recognized him from one of the apps, but I instantly blocked him because, like, he was, like, very creepy in his messages, and I, I blocked him immediately. The latest piece of a tragic puzzle here as the investigation continues. Jay Gray, NBC News, Orlando. President Obama continues to receive updates on the investigation and will travel to Orlando Thursday to meet with families of the victims. And since the investigation of that mass shooting is still underway, it's not known yet what potential police tactics may be developed for local agencies responding to similar calls. 
Omar Mateen, again, that man behind the deadly shooting, reportedly pledged allegiance to ISIS during a 911 call, as you heard. However, as Valley News Team's Neil Carlson shows us, that doesn't mean the local response to similar 911 calls will change, at least for now. Every year in the United States, there are over 240 million 911 calls. Here at the Grand Forks Dispatch Center, they handle over 10,000 calls a month. The coolie is nearby, so it's safe to assume they probably made their way there. That's how we Simple. Policy is already in place that allows them to respond quickly to an active shooter. That kind of event, we're going to send SWAT. Um, mm -hmm. immediately. There are certain things that we know based upon prior protocols that we would handle, but we will take direction from whoever the incident commander is. However, police say it does not make sense to start a new policy of automatically sending the SWAT team just because someone mentions ISIS in a 911 call like the Orlando shooter did. Quite frankly, that it would be a very dangerous precedent to follow if somebody says a particular phrase, almost no matter what that phrase is, that all of a sudden SWAT team is going to be activated and whatnot. Um, it's situationally dependent. We're going to respond to what people do. Meanwhile, there's state-of-the-art technology in the Valley to warn people of immediate danger. Alt says dispatch centers here in Grand Forks and Fargo have the ability to send warning messages directly to cell phones in a specific area. That's one of the tools that we can bring to the table to help warn the public if there's a barricaded subject or some kind of reason for them to stay sheltered in place. Unfortunately, no answer to preventing another Orlando yet, but agencies here and across the country are preparing to deal with the possibility of another one. In Grand Forks, Neil Carlson, Valley News Live. Those police warnings to cell phones in the Grand Forks and Fargo areas are available without users having to sign up for anything. But other areas around the valley require users to sign up for Code Red. You'll need to check with your county's sheriff's department to see what's available in your area. A hostage situation at a Texas Walmart turns deadly. Amarillo police say the hostage taker is dead, but no one else was injured. Officials were clearing the store when a SWAT team encountered the suspect and shot him. This all started around 11 in the morning after police responded to the Walmart for an active shooter. Police say the suspect took two people hostage. They're calling this a workplace violence incident. An investigation is underway to locate a vehicle involved in a hit and run crash that killed a 10 year old girl. And the Minnesota State Patrol is asking for your help. The crash happened Friday night on Highway 18 near Mille Lacs Lake. The state patrol is looking for the vehicle that struck and killed Kaylin Donovan. Anyone with information is asked to call Lieutenant Adam Fulton. The number is right there on your screen. Officials say the driver might not know that they were involved in the crash. A freak accident claims the life of a school district employee. Police say a man died yesterday while mowing the grass at Hannah Stadium in Valley City. 51-year-old Todd Heck was apparently killed killed when he went uphill with a zero turn type riding lawnmower. Police say the mower flipped and landed on his back. They're asking anyone with information on this case to contact Valley City Police. North Dakotans have just under three hours left to vote in today's primary election. 12,500 ballots have been cast in Cass County as of four this afternoon. Things have gone pretty smoothly, according to the Cass County election coordinator. This year, they had to change two of the 38 precinct locations. Mailers went out to those districts in West Fargo, but the postcards for one area had the wrong precinct information on them. Voters who normally vote at Triumph West Church had to travel down the road to Journey in Faith Church. Yeah, the card said to come here. Apparently, it was the church right in my backyard. <laughs> so. Not a big deal. The county tries not to change precinct locations, but in this case, all the growth in West Fargo is causing a space crunch. The other issue the county had this morning, some of the barcode scanners were not working properly for about one hour. Despite these hiccups, North Dakotans could be seen casting their ballots at various polling locations. Among them, North Dakota GOP candidate Doug Burgum, who we caught up with in Fargo, Wayne Stengem, who is also running for North Dakota governor, was in Bismarck where he cast his vote. North Dakotans have until 8 o'clock tonight to vote and then watch for results on Valley News Live online and on air.
From the White House to national TV, one West Fargo 12-year-old is cooking his way to fame. Carter Casola won the Healthy Lunchtime Challenge put on by Michelle Obama and is now going to be on Food Network's Chopped Junior. Thousands of kids tried out and only 45 were picked to be in the second season. Um, I think they'll be pretty surprised that a local kid was on Chopped Junior, but I was very calm and I think that's pretty hard to do on such a high stress show. It's a pretty um, big accomplishment. I'm really proud of myself and I think it was really fun. The episode airs tonight on Food Network at 7 p.m. The family says they'll be watching from home. Carter, of course, will be making an appetizer.